screen now, please. That's, there we go. Oh. Great, we're underway. Go Thanks. for it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for everyone uh, for tuning in. Uh, my name is Ben Schoenthal. I'm uh, the head of the religion program at the University of Otago. And it's my great pleasure on behalf of the program and uh, the Dhammakai Education Foundation, which has supported this uh, lecture series, to welcome uh, Dr. Trent Walker to give a series of lectures uh, starting today and all this week on uh, Buddhist poetry in Southeast Asia. Um, those here will know uh, Dr. Walker. Um, he specializes in Southeast Asian Buddhism, music, literature, manuscripts. Uh, he's published widely in several uh, languages, Khmer, Lao, Pali, Thai, uh, Vietnamese Buddhist texts, in several, several language texts, I should say. Uh, he hasn't, you haven't published anything in Pali yourself, no. I, um, and recently, he is the author of, uh, or he is the author of a book that's just come out recently, Until Nirvana's Time, Buddhist Songs from Cambodia, uh, which has just come out recently, um, and which we're all very excited about. Um, there's lots of uh, really wonderful things to say about him and his research, and um, but I don't want to take up too much of our time today. Uh, but what I do, would like to say is that uh, he's come all the way to New Zealand to give this series of lectures. Uh, taking time away from his commitments at Stanford right now in Palo Alto. Um, and we're very grateful that he's come all this way to be here. Um, and we're very grateful to you for tuning in. I know it isn't a completely convenient time for all of you, um, but I think you'll be uh, re rewarded for the time uh, with these, this set of lectures. So thank you very much, Trent. I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, just a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this, uh, so the, there will be a kind of interactive element to the discussions that will be recorded if you make some comments and then down the line feel strongly, I guess within 24 hours or less, uh, that you really don't want them, uh, you know, sort of out there on a YouTube channel that, you know, maybe not many people will see, but some might. Um, please do let me know. Uh, but other than that, I will take it as it's okay that we um, sort of have this recording out there, including comments. Um, and also this will be the time that we use every day for the next five days. So whatever you signed in for now, it's the same time slot uh, for the rest of the week. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Trent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for in in inviting me here, having it be possible to uh, give this series of talks. And it's such a pleasure to be here at the University of Otago, to be here in New Zealand, and to have a chance to, to speak and, and learn in conversation with all of you. So thank you. And those of you who are here uh, in the room, um, again, such a pleasure that, that you are here. Those of you who are on Zoom, uh, you'll see uh, that there's not an overwhelming number of people in the room here, but uh, I'll sometimes be talking maybe more to the camera, more to the screen up there, sometimes to uh, particular people here. As, as Ben mentioned, I'd like to make this a somewhat interactive space as much as that's possible within the, the boundaries of, <laughs> of Zoom. And so we'll just need to experiment a little bit together as to what will work best for that. And no pressure at all to participate. I'm, I'm happy to keep talking, but I think we will have a, a more enriching experience if there's some degree of, of dialogue as we go through. So before I offer some framing remarks on the series of these five lectures as a whole, and what I, in a sense, trying to, to do in them, I wanted to just get a sense from, from all of you about what, what brings you here. So in order to do that, I'd like you to respond in the chat, or if you're here in the room, you can maybe write this down um, and then uh, deliver that, deliver it orally. No, you can simply <laughs> let me know. Um, and there, there are two very simple questions. Uh, the first is, what's something you find interesting about Buddhist poetry? You can take that any direction you want to something you find interesting. Uh, and the second question is, what's something you're curious about or would like to know more about for Buddhist poetry in Southeast Asia? Questions make sense? So the first one is, what's something that you find interesting or cool or uh, distinctive about Buddhist poetry? 
Uh, and the second one being, what's something you'd like to learn more about for Buddhist poetry in Southeast Asia? Mm. And feel free to just, if you're on Zoom, to drop something in the chat. No pressure if you would not like to participate, but just giving you the invitation to do so, so I can get a better sense of what might be percolating for all of you as I, I move through these talks. Uh, could I tell you now? Of course, please go for yes. it. Uh, it's like I'm interested in your translation experience. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your book that you leave the belief intact. You just translate. You don't make it. You don't care if it's relevant to modern world or not. You leave it. And I, I would like to know how can you do it, something like that. And it, I believe it will help in my PhD thesis because it involves a lot of translation as well. Wonderful, wonderful. That's a fantastic question. And throughout, because I'll be bringing up translations of the text we're dealing with, let's keep reflecting together on, you know, what are some of the choices that one mm. can make in translation? Mm. You know, no, none of the translations I'll be sharing are definitive in any way. So I think there's lots of different choices we can take. And I think in those choices, I think we'll learn something methodologically together. So let's, yeah, let's keep that question alive. And can I ask your name? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Pra Egbodin Ratana. Wonderful, wonderful. Very nice to meet you. Awesome. Yeah. I would just share up there. Um, so Jing Ru Li wrote about metaphors used in Buddhist poetics and their deep meanings for various understandings. Um, and and, and also more connections and links with Mahayana Buddhist, po Buddhist poetry. I had the same thing. I was interested in metaphors and similes that are kind of are perennial. I mean, it seems like other people reacted. Um, a look also reacted with a heart to that one. So that seems to be a common thread. Great. I remember um, I first started hearing smote when I, when I was uh, going to Cambodian Buddhist temples mm -hmm. in Dunedin in the 80s. Wow. And I, uh, the late 80s, and I asked Paul Harrison about it. He said there was no such thing as dumb. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but it, was, you know, it wasn't done. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was something special mm -hmm. for Cambodia. They don't do it in Sri Lanka, do they? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. yeah. So, so and it was women singing. Yes. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Like, yeah. Okay. In the 1980s here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. That's when we had the refugees come over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can I say one thing yeah. briefly? So one thing that we'll we'll come back to is this question of performance, melody, mm -hmm. and different forms of Buddhist poetry. Um, it brings up this definitional question of like what counts as song, what counts as poetry, what counts as recitation. So that's one bit of it. But then the other part of how, do, how does the performance practice change how we read and interpret these materials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, uh, Yeah, um, uh, the thing that interests me about Buddhist poetry in Southeast Asia is not only, um, the poetry is not only reflect what we say is the main idea of Buddhism, like mm -hmm. Buddhism from India, but it's also reflect um, what the local Buddhists in that, yeah. in those region mm -hmm. reflect or respond to, to the idea from what we call Indian Buddhism. Mm. So it's how, how Buddhism local, is localized by local people. Fantastic, um, that's a really great point. And that, that will show up again and again, I think in the kinds of texts we'll look at. Um, and you're, you're totally right that poetry is a wonderful uh, lens with which to think about this process of localization and to think about what distinct kinds of ideas or doctrines show up in poetry that might not show up in other kinds of, of Buddhist texts. So that might be helpful to, again, to keep in mind as we go forward. 
I'll just call attention to Liedem Lefferts because he's just gone out of the screen there. Hmm. But I can read it here. It says, I don't know much about Buddhist poetry, but having spent considerable time working with and trying to understand the dynamics of Tet Lai, Isan monk singing as part of a sermon, I'd like to know more about, more and see how it interacts with other forms of Buddhist sermons and Tet Lai. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Liedem. So that, uh, the question between what counts as a sermon and what counts as poetry and the ways in which those recitation styles interact with one another, again, is something um, we'll need to come back to again and again. So for instance, the text that I'm gonna be focusing on today is one used for inviting monastics to give a sermon. And then some of the texts we'll look at throughout the week are ones that might be recited in a sermon context. Um, some of the recitation styles, some of the approaches have parallels for, to the Pele uh, or these kinds of uh, sung or chanted sermon styles used in Northeastern Thailand and other parts of the broader biosphere. So again, that's something, thank you for asking that and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Then we finally have Alexander Tran's comment there. Um, I can read that for you if you like. It says, I, I find Buddhist poetry interesting because it's an alternative way of learning about Buddhist doctrine, in addition to the sutras, commentaries, etc. I definitely share that opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to learn more about the Mahayana uses of Buddhist poetry and poetics and how it might differ from those of, of other traditions. Wonderful. So uh, again, those are questions we'll come back to, particularly the first one. The material that I've selected principally uh, for uh, the next few days is mostly coming out of Theravada traditions, though there will be some, a little bit of Mahayana material coming out of Vietnam and also out of an early period in Cambodia's history. So, um, but I think we need to, I think at least several of you are interested in that to keep that question alive too, even when we're looking at material that we put under this label of Theravada, how does that help us understand forms of Buddhism that fall outside of that as well? And it looks like, John Marston has a question here or a comment of, I've always been interested in the mnemonic aspect of poetry, the degree to which poetry becomes a tool to facilitate memory. Mm -hmm. That's uh, again, extremely important. We'll see that in a number of the, when we look at the metrical forms of the poetry, how they're structured in, as poetry, uh, what kinds of patterns around tone and rhyme or number of syllables, how that may be connected to mnemonic functions as well. I think there's also this question about some of these uh, poems are being transmitted orally and by people who aren't interacting with the written form of these texts at all. So there is a very strong role to memory, of course. And then there are also other forms of, of poetry that seem to be written with their written or their visual form in mind. So what does that mean to go across that spectrum? So thank you. This, this is uh, a really uh, rich set of questions and, and themes that, uh, that you all are bringing to the, to the table that uh, I hope to return to as we move through some of the materials I've selected. So thank you. And if you have more things to add, we're going to keep the chat um, feature open. Always feel free to um, chat in a question or a comment. Um, at any time. And for those of you here, always, of course, feel free to raise your hand or, you know, just want to make this, again, something where we can continue to learn through with each other throughout the process. So with that in mind, I'm going to uh, move on to a little bit of um, framing what I'm, I'm trying to, to do in these, these lectures with you all. So the question that uh, I, in a sense, am beginning with is what even is Buddhist poetry? How might we define, you know, I'm using this term. I've, you've been drawn to this uh, lecture series in a sense because of this term, but what does it really mean? And there's different ways that we could uh, understand it. And I think those different ways can be productive in how we come to, you know, understand this relationship between Buddhism and poetry. So, one way of understanding this, of course, is simply Buddhist texts written in verse. Now, what counts as verse and what counts as prose is not something that in all circumstances in Southeast Asia can be clearly defined, but in many cases it can. There are uh, particular metrical forms that are understood as verse, that are understood as poetry, um, and Buddhist texts can be transmitted in those forms. Does that mean that 
those texts are Buddhist poetry? Perhaps. Uh, another way of thinking about it, though, are verse texts that have uh, Buddhist themes. So, for instance, there are many verse texts uh, used, compo composed, transmitted in mainland Southeast Asian contexts, for instance, that are not in their overall framing or in the key parts of the plot or other elements, something that one would necessarily label as Buddhist. But there are nevertheless Buddhist themes showing up in those poems. Are those works also Buddhist poetry? Again, let's, let's keep thinking about that. So in essence, there's some dangers of using this, this, this term Buddhist poetry because we might be uh, limiting ourselves in the sense of we're, we're missing how Buddhism or Buddhist ideas show up in poetry that isn't necessarily labeled as Buddhist. Um, but there's also a, a, some possibilities that it opens up uh, when we see that, oh, well, maybe we need to take a more expansive view of what counts as Buddhist in textual production in mainland Southeast Asia. Maybe we need to take a more expansive view of what counts as poetry or certain types of things we might ordinarily think of as prose for instance, in certain kinds of sermons that have these uh, linking rhymes and other things that tie them into a uh, verse-like structure, even though overall they seem to be in prose, is that also a form of, of Buddhist poetry? So in essence, I'm interested in when we look at these intersections between categories like Buddhist and poetry, we can begin to trace a set of encounters uh, between Buddhist practices and ideas. And as you pointed out, uh, what I made, there's ideas that are ones we might identify as coming out of Buddhist scriptures composed in South Asia, as well as local kinds of ideas that are being um, developed in uh, Southeast Asia, as well as tracing encounters between particular practices and ideas around poetry that include uh, what we mentioned before around performance practices, uh, how do uh, melodies and other elements of performance fit in with these definitions, et cetera. So in summary, I'm interested in Buddhist poetry as, as, a, as a question, um, as a generative space, as a, a room like this room here, the broader Zoom room that you're all in uh, for, for conversation. And uh, Anushka, you've brought in a couple of uh, comments here that I think are, are relevant to what we were just discussing. You write, uh, my research is unrelated to poetry, but suttas or doctrine itself reads like poetry to me. Uh, the way suttas being delivered in a poetic way is beautiful. And to me, there's, there's two elements there. There's one, uh, the formal elements of Pali prose in the suttas. Um, how do those formal elements uh, can be understood as literature, can be understood as poetry. That's, that's something that's coming out. And then also the way suttas might be delivered, but they might be recited or used in a sermon. It also entails this element of aesthetic beauty. So how do we see a space for aesthetic beauty within how we read Buddhist texts? Um, and then the second question that you bring up here, Anushka, is how do you distinguish doctrinal content from quote unquote poetry? Again, Let's, uh, I can't answer that now, but let's keep thinking about that. Um, and we'll, we'll look at a few different um, examples um, as we move through. So to begin to open up more to these questions, uh, on the, the right side of the screen here is an inscription. Is anyone familiar with uh, where this inscription is? I think it's on Parpo. Yes, yes. And so can you tell us a little bit about the inscriptions at, at what pole? <gasps> you mean this particular? Not, not this particular one, uh, unless, you, unless you'd like to say something about this particular oh. one, but I, sort of the idea of sort of all the inscriptions at what pole, what do, uh, they, what do they tell us? So what pole is like um, the first university um, in Thailand. So monastic university in Thailand is getting a lot of um, you know, innovation, knowledge, um, cultural, and there are a lot of um, stone inscriptions surrounded the temple. Especially, it's very famous for um, what what we call it's um, stretching, like yoga, mm -hmm. um, uh, traditional Thai massage. So, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Wat Po or, or Wat Pachketupon is one of the most important temples from the Ratanakosin period or the current uh, dynasty of, of Thailand. Um, the roots of the temple and the site go back to the Ayutthaya period, but the key renovations that led to the site looking as it does today uh, come from the early Ratanakosin period. That is the uh, late 18th, early 19th century. Um, and part of those renovations included the installation of many, many inscriptions, you know, gathered in a book, this, it'd be about th this uh, thick of inscription, 500 pages, 600 pages or so of inscriptions. Uh, how many inscriptions? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember either, but there's a lot. There's and a lot, as yeah. you mentioned, some of them are uh, dealing with medicinal practices, with forms of, uh, yoga uh, practices, all kinds of other um, medicinal ideas are transmitted. There's also a whole set of uh, texts that are dealing with forms of poetry. So this is within a Buddhist temple, we have inscriptions of how to write different kinds of poems, giving examples of the, the metrical forms. And so this, I think, provides us a good uh, entry point to thinking about this question of Buddhist poetry. So we're in this important, royally sponsored uh, Buddhist temple in, in Thailand. Uh, and on the walls are poems. And not all the poems are Buddhist, not all the principles connected to the poems are Buddhist at all. Um, what does this uh, mean about how we might define Buddhist poetry? So let's take a closer look at this inscription. So it, you can see that there's four, um, actually four plus a fragment of a fifth text at the bottom visible on, on the photograph. And uh, each of these is just one stanza. So let's see, make sure, I think you can see my cursor, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one stanza there, and then another stanza yeah. here, another stanza here, another stanza there, and then uh, one that's sort of incomplete here. So let's take a closer look at two of these and see what it might tell us about um, Buddhist poetry. So um, let's start with this uh, first one on the upper left. Would anybody like to read this one aloud? Um, some weird. สังเวชสัตว์โลกสิ้นภาษาสุสุกุลสุกุลนิเวศสุนสุรโลกสุรโลกจนศพนาศพฟ้าภาษาฟ้าศพฟ้าอือหือปรเวศปรโลกหนสัตว์สิ้นแห่สิเวทล้ำโลกล่าศพฟ้าหรือปานครับ so uh, we'll get to the meaning of the text first but let's stay at the element of the visual yeah. so hopefully those of you on zoom and if you don't know thai script i was just trying to point where we are, the, the cursor seems to have a delay. So apologies if you're experiencing that. What do you notice about the visual form? It looks like sound waves. <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like sound waves. Yeah, it has this kind of, uh, so it's kind of divided into these different sections. Yeah, what else do you notice? Yeah, it is just, it is interesting the way it's present. So like um, the lines that, the word that had been shared, um, Sangwet, Nivet, Prawet. So the word Svet is shared um, and then connects to the next one. And yeah, it's quite interesting. And so this, this is a particular kind of uh, verse created for aesthetic purposes. Um, so it's given this title up here, Bon Klong Phuong Si Ton. So Phuong here means something like wreath or um, something that's woven together or garland. Um, and it's sort of here woven into four different sections. So we can see a section here, a section here, a section here, a section there. So we have this sense of it as a, the poem as something visual, not just something that exists 
in an oral context or in a performative context, but something that exists on the page of a manuscript or here on the wall of a temple. And uh, what I made, as you pointed out, the particular trick or in this term gala in, in Sanskrit, uh, pronounced kon in Thai here, refers to these um, this artifice, maybe is a way of understanding this word, used to uh, create poems with these very complex um, rules that govern how they're composed. So this one meaning the second um, syllable of each line, as well as the fourth syllable, as well as the sixth syllable, um, all are the same word. So that's why we have them merging down into one word, et cetera. And really word is not quite the right definition here because uh, actually everything here in the first, uh, the first syllable, uh, these are not complete words. They're completed by the second Sound. syllable of way. Um, so again, we have something that's really playing with sound and the visual at the same time. And then if we look at the meaning, we can think about, you know, is this a, is this a Buddhist poem or not? And what does that mean? So in terms of just reading back to it again, Sangwe Sa Lo Sim So here the way Sangwe is spelled is not the way we'd expect it to be spelled today, but this is a um, we normally expect it to have the chang at the end. Um, and this would be a word that is related to the Indic term samvega. Some way get that, of that sense of being stirred or being shaken by the encounter with something that's impermanent. And so it also has the sense of have, have pity on or have compassion for, et cetera, like in the sense of understanding something as impermanent. So again, that first line, um, quake for or be, be moved, be stirred by, have pity on the sattva lokya, the, the world of living beings, sin sop sakon, uh, it all uh, comes to an end. And then uh, the next line, niwe suralo jon sop fa, the niwesha, the, the dwelling place um, of the suralo, the suralokya uh, of the heavens extends uh, throughout the skies, extends throughout the heavens. Then the next part, prawe uh, paralo. Um, sort of entering into the paralo, um, the, the next realm, in other words, the realm that, have, that, that living beings are born into after death. That is the path in which all uh, living beings end. Then we have this last line, which again, we can think about what, how is this working in a Buddhist context? So the line here goes, si we lam, uh, sorry, si we lam lok la. So far, um, so siwe here uh, is a combination of the term shiva, uh, which in a outside of a Buddhist context would be understood as the deity shiva. Inside of a Buddhist context is understood as the this kind of root meaning of the term peace, or as a synonym for nirvana plus isha, this term that means lord. But in a uh, Thai poetic context, can be freely combined with other Indic terms to. Uh, create a, like a slightly loftier version of that term. So siwe here is simply a synonym for nirvana. And then lam lo la, that exceeds, that goes beyond uh, the world, goes beyond the, the earth. Um, so fa rupan, and all in the heavens, rupan, cannot be compared uh, to this nirvana. So thinking about the meaning of this, is this a Buddhist poem? So it, the, the meaning is pretty straightforwardly a Buddhist poem, but it, yet it's transmitted in this uh, context of focusing on the set of aesthetic principles to create this very ornate uh, structure, uh, very different than we might uh, ordinarily uh, see in uh, certain kinds of Buddhist context. So let's look at the, the second poem here. Um, Sorry, Chuck, is there any other way to read that? Could you read the three middle syllables and does that mean something separate or is there, is that there's just that one convention of reading? There are other kinds of poems that uh, have these acrostic functions, particularly yeah. in a Thai context, where sometimes you could read the, the whole thing normally, but then you could also read the first syllable of each line that would have its own meaning. Yeah. Here, we can't do that. 
um, I don't think that, yes, this would not form a complete set of meaning. And the second syllable, way doesn't have any meaning on its own. Right. It's only completed by the different uh, upasarga, these Indic prefixes that come before it. Right. Um, so in, as I understand it, this is the only way it can be read. But there are other kinds of visually um, specified poetic forms like this, where there are these alternative modes of reading. And we'll get to one of those actually in the next one here. So let's take a look at this second one. Um, again, would someone like to read this one for us? Anyone in the Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> Please go for it. Gon Klong Sakawa Sakawa Sap San Dan Dirt Can Kung Kit San Salut Rantotit Hun Kong Karai no Pachamamit. Is it Pachamit? I think it's Pachamit. Pachamit. My love luck, Sunny, Sunny Nim Nong Ni Rat Rang Hang Riam Dariam. เทวเทวเวอร์ชัลเลเนตเดียวดอยสร้อยเศร้าหมองพักคล้ำช้ำจิตสุดจิตสุดคิดจะพร้องจะบอกใครใครจะช่วยร้องท่องทวนเหยเ
So there's definitely a set of rules that are operating here. And the, the way it relates is to the, the question you raised, Ben, is there's a clone form hidden within the clone. So this on the surface is a clone. It's on the surface in one meter. And then the, the, the meaning, of course, of this, would you read this as a Buddhist poem? We can don't have to go in the translation, but does it does it sound Buddhist for those of you who are, understand the meaning? I don't think. I don't think so. No, it, it seems to be a, a lament over yeah, uh, a lover who is spurned and is uh, afraid that he's 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 lost his lover to someone else. That's you might broadly understand the context. There's nothing specifically Buddhist about what's going on here, um, but there's this interesting play of the poetic form. So if we were to read this in the ordinary way, sakawa sap san dan do it can that ends one line. Kun kit sen salut ron totin ends the second line. Each eight syllables long, etc. In this glon form, but we could also, if we cut off the sakawa, since that's just a formal part of the the form, and cut off the last bit, then we see hidden within this there's this uh, clone text, a uh, clone text that goes something like. Sap สาบสาหุนดานเดือดแค้นเครื่องคิดเส้นสกลนรันทุจิตคุณของนิราชรังหางเรียมอัน then a new clown verse would start so the idea is that that's not the way that a clown verse would be recited it's breaking up the um the ordinary rules of of clown but hidden within that is this whole other poetic form so this is just a way of opening this question of this is carved into buddhist temple it's not at all a Buddhist text by content, is this Buddhist poetry? Or is it you know, something that's taking place within a so-called secular sphere, if that's something that we can define or think about for this period of time? Um, might not make sense for this period of time. But uh, as we look through different pieces, let's keep these kinds of questions in mind. What's happening with the forms? What's happening visually? What's happening with the recitation? When it's recited a particular way, it becomes one, one style. When it's recited another way, it becomes another style, et cetera. So what do we mean even by reading? This is the other part of the title, <laughs> reading Buddhist poetry. So. Um, in many different Southeast Asian languages, the term for reading often means reading aloud. That's the, the basic sense. So uh, when we talk about reading Buddhist poetry, are we reading it silently? Are we having a silent appreciation, understanding what's going on? Certainly at certain periods of Southeast Asian history and in the present, that's a very common mode. Or are we talking about things that are to be read or recited aloud? Or do we mean reading in this broader sense of a kind of engaged analysis that in theory, that's what we're, we're all doing here in this, this academic space. So, but let's try to keep these different senses of reading alive. Overall, my goal here is to deepen our aesthetic and also intellectual appreciation of Buddhist poetry in, in mainland Southeast Asia in particular. And through that, I hope that we can discover together new ways of reading texts. And some of these uh, will try to move beyond the borders of tra traditions, languages, particular nation states that are often the way that poetic traditions in particular in Southeast Asia are studied. And through that, I hope we can develop a sense of our own curiosities about the subject. That's why I, at the beginning, I'm asking you to share what's, what's bringing you here, what questions are, are present for you as you work through this material. Um, and then, of course, also we'll come up with many unanswered, sometimes unanswerable questions, and that that's that's part of the process. That's, of course, very much germane to the study of poetry writ large, and of course to the to the study of Buddhism. Mm -hmm.
So the geographic focus, as you know, for this series will be on mainland Southeast Asia, uh, particularly on materials from Tem Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. Of course, the sort of broader sphere of what we think of mainland Southeast Asia is in interaction always with what's beyond that, what's what's happening in the Southeast Asian archipelago, but also particularly what's happening in South Asia and East Asia. Um, so to constantly think about the geographic situatedness and the, the emplacement in time and culture and language is essential to understanding these texts. The primary languages for Buddhist poems in, in the region include texts written in a variety of different language families. So some are in Sinitic, sort of literary Chinese texts. Um, one of you mentioned, or two of you mentioned actually, interest in the, the place of Mahayana a Buddhist texts in mainland Southeast Asia. The, the largest uh, surviving body of uh, Mahayana Buddhist texts composed in Southeast Asia are those composed in literary Chinese and also in Vietnamese um, in uh, modern, what's now Vietnam. Um, there are also texts, of course, composed in Indic languages in Pali and Sanskrit, some composed in South Asia, but also many composed in Southeast Asia. And we'll look at some examples of those. Um, there are many different ways of trying to understand what um, does what is an indigenous language in mainland Southeast Asia? This is a very complex question because human migration and the movement of people in Southeast Asia is something that's been constantly in process for thousands of years. So some of the languages that have uh, been here, been in mainland Southeast Asia for longer include those of the Austroasiatic family, including languages like Mon and Khmer or Khmer and Vietnamese. Um, some of the languages that came a little bit later to the region um, are those in the southwestern Thai family, such as Thai or Lao or Lanna or Shan, Kun, Lu, Thai Nu, etc. And then also those in this Burmish family, Burmese or Rakhinese, etc. I don't um, know Burmese or Rakhinese, and we won't be looking at poems there, but if you um, are familiar with those traditions, I'd love to bring your thoughts in on how they might interact with some of the materials we'll be looking at. The, the story that I want to take us through today is one that looks at this question of language in the formation and transmission of uh, Buddhist poetry in mainland Southeast Asia. And that, as you saw in the abstract, that's the overall theme for the lecture today. And uh, there I wrote that many Buddhist poems from Southeast Asia are products of an interconnected web of translations between languages across the region over a period of centuries. Sort of what I've tried to visually represent here, this is different um, scripts and translation of this one particular text for the invitation of a monastic to preach that we'll be looking at today. Um, this is, again, this way of thinking about how language is present in this process of translation between different uh, languages in Southeast Asia. So one question I'll be asking is how do these historical and linguistic layers affect how we read Buddhist poems? In other words, is it possible to read a Buddhist poem only in one particular linguistic and temporal instantiation, or do we have to understand it across the broader sweep of time in which it has been transmitted? And so, here, as I uh, trace examples of this Pali chant, as it uh, transforms throughout its translations into Thai, into Khmer, into Vietnamese, um, I'm hoping we can develop a sense of this interplay between languages and how that shapes the ways in which Buddhist texts are produced um, as well as performed. The image here is from a, a temporal mural at uh, Wat Sarawan Baekyo. This mural has now since been destroyed in the uh, renovation of this particular temple. Um, but uh, it shows, well, actually, before I say anything, what, what does it show? Uh, Brahma invited the Buddha. Yes, fantastic. And how do we know this is Brahma? <laughs> yes, so we, we can't see the head in the back, but we can assume that there's one more head in the back that we see, uh, one more face, I'm sorry, in the back, that this is the four-faced um, depiction of Brahma, which is a very common iconographical depiction of Brahma um, in uh, Cambodian, Thai, and Lao cultures in particular. 
and he is inviting the Buddha. What is he inviting the Buddha to do? To preach. It's the Dharma. To preach. And why? Why doesn't doesn't the Buddha just want to preach the Dharma? What's going on? What's the story? He realized it's as fully hard to teach all the <laughs> sentient being to attain nibbana to enlighten. So it's a it's a real end of mind, but um, and Brahma um, says no, and then says descent and invited the Buddha. Well, there is a there is some people who has a um, who has less delusion, or mm -hmm. um, some of them some of them has too much illusion in the mind. Mm -hmm. Some of them not mm -hmm. so. So you, you, um, the Buddha can teach those who are ready for, for and take sheep and lunch, man. Beautiful, fantastic. And we're as we look through different instantiations of the text, we'll see different elements of the themes you raise, like the Buddha's reluctance, the idea that living beings are mired in delusion, the idea that some beings are perhaps more suitable to uh, receiving uh, teachings from the Buddha, et cetera. Uh, these will all show up in uh, the, the text that, that we explore, but that's absolutely right. This is the, the basic story that this, this image is, is representing. So the core verse that's associated with this story is um, one that comes, it's actually the very first verse of the Buddha Vangsa. The Buddha Vangsa has been, um, there's some debate about when exactly this text would have been composed. Um, some have argued that it's a relatively late addition to the Pali uh, body of scriptures um, and has some you know, linguistic features that place it in that somewhat later uh, development of text as well as doctrinal features. And in essence, the Buddha Vangsa is the, the story of, or the, the lineage of, of different Buddhas, how they um, came to awakening, et cetera. And it serves this, this very key text for Buddhology, Buddhology in the sense of studying what the meaning of Buddhas are, tracing the lineage of Buddhas in the Theravada tradition. But it's this very first verse that's been excerpted from that and used in a ritual context, um, quite commonly across the, at least in Cambodian, Thailand, Laos, and in Vietnam, in Theravada context. I don't know, for instance, in a Sri Lankan context, if this is, if this verse is used. Um, there may be other ways in which uh, monastics would be invited to preach, or I don't actually don't know to what extent it shows up in a Burmese context. Of course, the text of the Buddha Vangsa is very much known in both of those uh, locations, but there's maybe something distinctive that's happening within the Cambodian, Thai, Lao, and then later in, in the Vietnamese context around this verse. So, when this uh, text is uh, recited, um, usually there's a certain melody that's given to it. Um, that melody may depend on the particular cultural context. Uh, the one I've described, uh, transcribed into musical notation here is one that's commonly used in Thailand, though there are a variety of different melodies that are used in Thailand. And so one realization of the melody is something like, Prama Jaloka Ti Pati Sahampati. But there are a variety of other melodies that might be applied. Um, this is an example of the of a melody. And we'll return to that melody later because it's one that shows up in the Khmer translation of this, this text as well. Um, but first, let's just take a little bit of a look at the, the initial Pali stanza. This, some of the findings here that I'll be sharing come from this article um, that I published in 2020 in the Journal of Vietnamese Studies called A Chant Has Nine Lives, the Circulation of Theravada Liturgies in Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And if you're interested in some of the details of these texts, you feel free to, to check um, that out. Um, uh, there's a, you can freely, there's a PDF accessible on my website. Um, that article is more concerned with what this shows historically around the founding of the 
this particular um, Theravada tradition among ethnic Vietnamese communities in, in Vietnam. So that I won't be talking about as much today, but um, using it as, as a way to, again, bring us into how the transmission of Buddhist poems across languages reveals something about how we might want to read them. So looking at this Pali uh, verse initially, again, this uh, almost all uh, poetry in Pali is uh, divided into uh, four lines uh, for Bada in this context, um, and to together forming one verse, sometimes referred to as a gadha. And uh, there is a particular metrical uh, pattern that's being used here, though there's um, some variations in the transmission of this text, as well as some problems if we try to scan it metrically. But in essence, Pali poetry, for those who are not familiar with it, just like in Sanskrit poetry, the basic structure of what makes a poem a poem is that it's divided into lines in these ways and that the lines have particular patterns of short and long syllables. So um, that means that this generates a particular rhythm when it's recited. Brahma jalo ka tipati saham pati katan jali antiparang ayajata, et cetera. Just on the basis of those short and long syllables. Um, again, there's some variations in the, the, the Southeast Asian version, the meter has been smoothed out a little bit um, uh, so that this compound instead of anadivarang reads anadivarang. But uh, this, these kinds of patterns are common when a text is being recited in this way. In other words, the very process of recitation and an effort to make it as easy and clear as possible to recite and to fit in within melodies may cause some minor changes to develop in, in these texts so that there's this harmonization between the text and its performance practice. But this is, in essence, the, the narrative that you described for us, uh, Warame. This is, this is Brahma appealing to the Buddha, saying some of the beings here, even though many of them are uh, filled with the divine ones, some have just minor ones. Um, this is this compound, Aparajapka Jatika, those that have the nature of Jatika of having um, alpa, alpa in Sanskrit, this kind of lesser. And then this term rajak, uh, can be understood in a couple ways. One, it can be understood as those whose eyes ak, have raja, have uh, pollution in them. Or it can be understood as those who are polluted with namely the be rajas plus ka, and then just like in other kinds of verbal form, um, nominal formations in Pali and Sanskrit, this can be a, a derivative of rajas plus ka, can go to rajaka. Um, so two ways of understanding, but, but the same basic idea of beings with minor uh, defilements. And then asking the Buddha to uh, preach, um, having mercy for this generation, for this, this particular group, this body of, of living beings. So this is something that we don't have a clear historical idea when it was first used as a text to invite a monastic to preach. Um, but at a certain point, um, texts like these began to be translated into different Southeast Asian vernaculars. So this is one of the oldest versions I was able to find. This is not, this is translated into Thai, but it's not the usual version that one would see translated into Thai. This is a, re a transcription of an oral version that was preserved on a now defunct Buddhist web board in Thailand. Mm. So I don't have any further evidence about where this comes from, but uh, linguistically it's older than the, the most common version uh, used today for this purpose in Thailand. Um, and there are you know, aspects about the way the meter works here that's uh, a bit complex. We don't need to go into that now. Um, for now, I would uh, just have us look at what's happening in terms of the, the meaning here, what might be uh, staying the same or what might be tr uh, being transformed. So, of course, the way that this has been translated into Thai, we see that it's not just one stanza anymore, it's suddenly now five. So there's been an expansion. Details have been added that have uh, uh, that are corresponding to how the translator is understanding what's happening within the polytext. 
The other thing, and we'll look at this when we look at the slightly more recent Thai translation as well, is that the meter that's been chosen, um, this is a meter known as Gap Yani Sip It, um, though it has some features of certain Chan or these other kinds of more elaborate meters in Thai as well, um, is, is one that can be recited with the same uh, melody as one might use for the Pali. So there's this attempt in translation to harmonize the performance practices uh, between these texts. Um, and so even when we look at, uh, say, this, the, the third line here, Ang Het, so there's a uh, that rhythm that's being built into it. Uh, rhythm we can understand is two plus three, and then three plus three. I'll, let me um, put the cursor on the romanization here. So ang um, hit being the initial two syllables, and then we have three syllables. Uh, and then again, we have, uh, then for the second line, we have three syllables. Um, uh, and then again, we have some hypermetrical syllables here for these unstressed syllables that's very common. Um, and then again, we have the pattern repeating two, three, three, three. Sa ki, mi mud mon, malahai, gile palai. And again, because it's happening within. Again, there's some hypermetrical syllables happening here. Again, very, very common. If you're counting, some of you are looking at your counting. Wait, this doesn't add up to five and six. It doesn't add up to 11. It's not adding the way it should be. And that's, um, uh, it's really following on how the performer realizes which syllables are unstressed and therefore not counting towards that syllable count. Um, so this is, something that we see in, in Thai, Lao, and Khmer poetry in particular. This is not a feature as much in Vietnamese poetry when we look later. When Vietnamese poetry is structured by syllable count in some of these traditional forms, generally it's not possible to insert a hypermetrical syllable. Um, but in the uh, Thai, Lao, and Khmer context, very common to have this. And that's, again, why the melody is so important, because it ties together the performance, even across a text that may appear um, uneven in its metrical realization. Then when we look at the meaning, perhaps it's the same thing, just expanded in some way. We, we are introduced to Brahma. Um, uh, then he presses his palms together in the second syllable um, and asks uh, or makes this request to the, the Buddha here being described as the um, Dashabala, the ten powered Lord uh, Prathosopon. And then uh, we have the substance of his request um, saying that there are beings in the universe who are dull um, and then those who are racked with defilement. Um, but please um, preach so that you might be able to, to save them. So they, some of those beings might be able to reach um, nirvana. So the same basic meaning, but uh, encapsulated in this other form. Mm -hmm. If we look now to the, this more recent Thai translation, and this is the one that one would more commonly hear in a Thai context today. Um, again, if we transcribe the musically what's happening in the melody, that same melody with some minor changes due to how the tones of Thai uh, cause minor changes to occur in the melody when these kinds of texts are recited, we see that the poetic form that's chosen, this ka yani sip et meter, is one that allows to retain this kind of performative parody with what's happening in the Pali. And the meaning here, the, the way the, the this particular version in Thai is, is uses simpler vocabulary, more common and more present day vocabulary than the previous text. It also scans a little bit more easily. There's not as many hypermetrical syllables and that those are some of the reasons I can imagine that this has been the one that uh, by consensus is more often used in a Thai context for this purpose. But we see that the meaning is essentially the same. We have these two introductory stanzas um, of who is uh, Sahambati, uh, and what is he doing? He's bowing down before the Buddha uh, to make this request. And then we have the three stanzas of this request. Um, uh, this is now stanza four and five. Uh, four is completing the request. And then we have uh, something that wasn't there in the previous two versions and isn't in the Pali version at all. That is that the Buddha um, 
accepted uh, this request um, and assented to the Brahma deity on the grounds of his um, august compassion, Varunya um, And then we have something that we didn't see at all in the last two versions either. And this is where we're suddenly moved out of the narrative frame of uh, Brahma long ago inviting the Buddha to the very present. So that's the sense of this line here. We invite you, O Venerable, you who are comparable to the victor, that is to the Buddha, save beings and spread the karma so as to illuminate and enlighten. In other words, this, this invocation to the Venerable, Prakuntan uh, here, means the monastic in the present moment who is the one being invited to preach. So the uh, in other words, the comparison here is just as the Buddha was uh, out of compassion, uh, was uh, agreed to preach for the sake of living beings, so too should you, O venerable uh, monastic. And generally speaking, this would be for a monk. In some uh, recent context, it can also be used for bhikkhuni as well. Um, but uh, that uh, monastic is being compared in a sense. Uh, and this is how it's brought into this ritual present. And we'll see as this text journeys throughout these different lives in Southeast Asia, how this portion, the portion that connects into uh, the very concrete ritual manifestation of what's happening in the narrative is one that gets increasingly expanded. So the next stage in the development of this text historically, these two Thai versions probably date from the 18th century or so, but they're part of this broader body of short poems in Thai that are used in Buddhist contexts that are rarely recorded in palm leaf manuscripts. Sometimes they're recorded in paper manuscripts that record some of these more <laughs> informal kinds of texts, but they're almost always anonymous and it's very difficult to historically trace uh, where they come from. But they're part of this question, as you mentioned, uh, what I made about how do we understand the, the localization of Buddhism? It's not just happening through these longer texts, often composed in elite settings that are maybe more easily accessible in manuscript traditions, but also those that were often only recited orally that might be passed down in an oral context. This case recited really only by lay people um, and at certain points in, in history would have been uh, today, it's more common to have women recite this text. I don't know how far that tradition goes back into the past. Um, but uh, it, at the very least, it's one that's happening really within a lay context. So now I'd like to, to move on to this, this second expansion of, of the Pali verse. So we had that original first verse, if you remember the one that uh, was the first verse of the, the Buddha Vangsa, and then it's been translated into Thai in these various ways. At some point later on, again, we don't know, this could be in the 18th century, it could have been several centuries earlier than that, but it, the, at least by the 18th century, this verse was composed. Um, again, I'm not aware of evidence for it outside of Cambodia, Thailand, and Laos, so my guess is that it was composed somewhere um, in one of the areas in which Pali textual production was important during the last uh, five or 600 years in, in, in Cambodia, Thailand, and Laos. So most likely in central Thailand or northern Thailand, um, but it could have been composed elsewhere as well. And this one introduces a simile around the, the nature of the, the Dharma. And uh, the, the verse goes, it's sort of continuing in the same poetic style as the first verse, the one borrowed from the Buddha Vangsa, but this is really uh, one that expands specifically for this, the meaning of the, the present context. So dhamma bhairin, vuniyang chakayang, sutancha bandhang, apidhamma chamang, akonta yanto, chathu satcha dandang, apodhaneye parisaya mache. The drum of the true dharma, uh, whose frame is the vinaya, whose straps are the sutta, whose leather head is the apitama, striking this drum, whose mallet is the four truths, awaken those fit to be led in the midst of the assembly. And the earliest evidence we have that I've seen for this, this text is uh, from a, um, an early collection of uh, 
chance that was gathered, I think, during the first or second reign. You may know this connection better. First or second yeah. reign, do you recall? Yeah. First, yeah. first, first reign of the Ratnakusin dynasty, so uh, uh, late 18th century. Um, and it was published later on as Nangsu, so Mon Ple, but originally it was a palm leaf manuscript. Um, and uh, this is the sort of earliest example of this particular uh, text. Um, and I just wanted to, before we look at how it gets translated into Thai and how it gets expanded in various ways, this image here is of a uh, drum. Would any, is it a little too small to read up there? So it says, ham uh, len. So no, um, it's, it's forbidden to uh, hit this drum, uh, not for an official purpose or out of play or for, for fun. Um, and uh, and then it gives the this uh, gloss of like what's going on. Aratana. This is this word for in, inviting uh, a monk to preach, which is the very context of this verse we're looking at. So, um, drum is not allowed to be used playfully. It's only to be struck uh, for at the time in which a monk is giving a sermon. So. Again, we have a physical object that's sort of tying in how this particular poem is, is used. Then the earliest translation we have of this is in that same collection, Nang Su Suan Mon Ple, the translated chants uh, dating from the first uh, reign. And the style of translation here is uh, what in other contexts I would call a, a bi-text. It's a, it combines portions in Pali with portions in a vernacular language, in this case, Thai, here alternating uh, phrase by phrase, in some cases, word by word, um, to give a, a very close literal translation of what's happening in the Pali, how it's intended to be understood by the compiler of this bi-text. So um, this is a sense the same meaning that we saw in the English uh, translation, but this is simply the earliest way in which it's, um, it's been uh, used. Because this is a book of, of chants, and, and their translations, we don't know about the exact performance practice. It's not terribly common in most contexts in Thailand today for by texts to be recited outside of a sermon context. In other words, for, this, for them to be recited in this liturgical way or to an, invite a monastic to preach in this kind of uh, bilingual alternating words and phrases. Um, but it may be that that was something that occurred in the past or that this was used as a text for the study of these kinds of chants. This we don't fully know. Um, but in, in any case, this verse came to be particularly important with the Cambodian translations and adaptations of uh, these poems. So that's uh, where I'm going to turn to next. Um, before I get there, and we'll look at some of the, the manuscripts in which these Cambodian versions are found, um, we have also been going for about an hour, and <laughs> you may have some questions, um, or I may want to have a sip of water, and, um, <laughs> but I, I just want to make sure that I'm not purely talking to you without there being some interactive uh, part of this. So if you have any questions now, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you can also, I don't know if it's possible to raise yeah, your they, hand. I think they can, they can, they can speak. speak. Yeah, yeah, I think you can speak. So you can simply unmute yourself and speak if you'd like. Um, I always find that really intimidating when I am a participant on a Zoom event. So I, I feel you. Figuring out how to press the right button. Well, that too, yes. <laughs> so, okay, so what I'm reminding yeah. of is that this is very much in the Mahayana tradition where you bang the drum. Um, Mm. Yeah. That's a very good point. That, that little... Yes. So in, in a, a Mahayana liturgical context, mm -hmm. say in, in China, in, in Vietnam, in uh, Japan, in Korea, the recitation of Buddhist texts is uh, very, very frequently accompanied by uh, the beating of, of this usually object that's shaped like kind of a, like a fish made out of wood, uh, known as ma in, in, in Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in Japanese, this kind of uh, object that keeps time. Mm -hmm. And then there are other kinds of drums that might be used for marking time within a monastery, other kinds of ritual uh, settings as well. Um, but it's very rare in a Theravada context 
Again, there are exceptions. There are ways in which drums appear in certain forms of chanting in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. the way they might appear in other forms yeah. of, of uh, but it's not super common for the, the drum to accompany every beat. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not what's being uh, suggested here that the drum would literally be used for every beat. Mm -hmm. And this image of a drum here, again, this would be used, I think, to announce that the sermon is to happen or to a part of this ritual invitation, not to, uh, mark time while chanting, and certainly not to drown out the preacher whilst he is <laughs> preaching. <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty noisy um, in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what about Kong Ken? I mean, what about your song? I'm just thinking, it's, it's came across my mind that some of the temple don't use the drum, but they use Kong. Yes, oh, yes. Um, yeah. Kong, it's, um, I mean, yeah. I'm just interested in the metaphor that, that they use here. Yeah. So um, they probably suggest why they make the Kong like there is uh, the frame, there is like something like this. Mm -hmm. The reason why they, they made the, the Kong, um, the, the drum, like, mm -hmm. the shape of the drum like this. Um, so a Kong, a Kong is usually what we would translate as a gong, a metal drum. It's a metal um, percussion instrument that one hits with a big mallet. Yeah. Um, usually this term drum is used for things that have a leather yeah. head or other kinds of uh, vibrating head, as opposed to the whole instrument, like the kong, the whole instrument vibrates in this way. But I think that's really interesting to point out that it also has this frame. It also you know, has some of these kind of elements, just like a drum, of course, has a head, has a frame, has these uh, straps. Uh, this particular drum isn't one that's tied with straps, but other kinds of drums would be, particularly drums in a South Asian context often are tied together with straps, et cetera, that holds the resonant chamber together. And they use more drums like in Lao, right? I think in Yisan, Laos, they okay. use both. I think mm -hmm. drum and just a bit a more common middle drum. And particularly to mark time. Yeah. And to say like now is the time for people to come to chant. Now is the uh, now is pain. Now is the time to eat lunch. Um, when the enemy is coming, get ready. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no. And like Kempachia Chrome, they have a lot of the drum thing, and <gasps> that was because they were scared. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So then we use horn. Horn. Yeah. Uh -huh. In. Um, in Ilana. Ah. Okay, so music. So there's more percussion than music is mm. more common perhaps than it is now. Mm. now people... No, um, yeah. But what interests me is that the metaphor they compare yes. um, you know, straps of the sutra. Yeah, the vinaya with um, the frame or the drum or the strings with the four throughs. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite common for, um, so I, I found something that use some metaphor, but it's in vernacular. Ah. But it's, 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 it's in a um, vernacular meditation manual. Mm -hmm. It's used like they compare the body of the practitioner, like the role of the, the Sangha compared to the Vinaya or something like that, or the bell with yeah, the sutra. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, that's a really good point. Yes, it's really interesting. Yes, that's a very key metaphor in the traditional meditation systems of yeah. Southeast Asia, connecting the different elements of, an, of the monastic robe yeah. to different parts of the yeah. Buddhist scriptures, for sure. I mean, there is some element, you know, this idea that there's there is um, some double entendres going on in the Pali there that would you could interpret some of that, right? The idea of sutra as bandham also has that oh, yeah, bandham, um, yeah, tying yeah. it, you know, but you know, there's yeah. there's double entendres at, at play. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great point. I never thought about that. Oh, yeah. John, yeah. So one term we'll come back to is this term in the last line here, this term um, is one that gets commentarily expanded mm -hmm. upon uh, later on. So literally it's the sense of those fit to be led, mm -hmm. um, but it's part of this broader commentarial level distinction between the four types of, of living beings. Um, this also gets expanded in a, in a Mahayana Buddhist context as well, but here we're seeing this sort of Theravada and, and instantiation of this idea of uh, um, different kinds of beings have different- Naya, mm -hmm. Naya, 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 Naya. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. It's, the, it's a lock attack term, is that? Uh, here, I think it's in the... Um, subjective. Oh, in the, in the, Not subjective. It's in the, the accusative. It's in the accusative. Yeah, the accusative plural uh, uh, um, of the. I'm trying to say. But that's how I was understanding it. Okay. But but. Okay. Forgive me. Sorry, I'm not um, thinking clearly about uh, how this is being okay. translated. Let's let's take a look at the by text, okay. and how how are they understanding this term, and okay. we can see whether this makes sense. Um, so, it's understanding it as an accusative, but if a, but. Grammatically, is it locative? I will. I will think about this more, and tomorrow I'll. Uh, and you should think about it more, and we can we can decide what what's going on. Um, here, it's being translated as yeah. if it's an accusative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, let's move on now, unless there are further questions from those of you in the audience and on in the Zoom overs. Time. Uh, um, let's let's move on to uh, how this text evolves and changes in a Cambodian context. So um, there are various versions of uh, chants used for uh, inviting monastic to to preach, um, and it, within a Cambodian context. And the most common version is actually not the one we're looking at the image of, of here. This is from a manuscript. The manuscript itself dates, I think, from the late 19th century, but it was subsequently added on in the early 20th century with additional um, writing. It's from Kabung Cham uh, province, uh, from Wat Saang, I believe. And it includes this uh, version of a uh, this particular translation of these two stanzas in Pali that I wasn't familiar with before, except through um, a, a very learned uh, uh, lay person and scholar in Cambodia, Kun Sophia, who sadly pa passed away uh, a few years ago, um, but who, who had also memorized uh, this text and had his own oral version um, of it. But this is one uh, written version of this uh, translation. And when we look at it, um, uh, we can see that it's also a translation of these same two verses. In other words, the original one coming from the, the Vangsa and then this later version composed sometime in the past 500 years in uh, mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and the, the text is in this, the equivalent meter as the, the Thai translations we were looking at. So one thing that's quite interesting across certain um, bodies of poetry in Southeast Asia, there are some meters that are shared, even though, for instance, Khmer is in this Austroasiatic language family and uh, Thai is in this Southwestern Thai branch of the broader Gadai family, um, they still are able to share some poetic meters. So these particular sets of meters known as Ga in Thai appear to be borrowed from, from Khmer at some point. Um, and that's why we also, of course, see them in Khmer. And so the parallel to this uh, uh, meter in Thai is known as the Brumagit uh, meter in Thai. Brumagit means something like uh, Brahmas, um, and then plus Gita, um, in this case, Giti, but um, Brahmas song meter is the usual way in which this is understood. But it's the same um, basic structure without, of course, any tone rules uh, that. There's one tone rule that exists in the Thai version, but since Khmer is not a tonal language, there are no tone rules in the this particular meter. But it still has this basic structure of five syllables, six syllables, five syllables, six syllables uh, for a total of 22. And then typically those are divide them in terms of how we understand the meaning into two, three, three, three. So something like ri prum dachia thom grailing prum pong nia the blood prejong kia look at han masaka. And looking at the meaning, we have basically the same sense, but this has been expanded. This text, I forget exactly how long it is, but it's something like between 20 and 25 stanzas. I haven't put the whole thing up, but it's, it goes uh, and it expands upon many of the, the tales that we saw in the Thai versions of which it was probably inspired by in some sense, as well as trying to bring out the meaning in the various uh, 
aspects of those two quite dense uh, polyverses. So we have this expansion of the idea of uh, how this term uh, is meant to be understood. And here we have it very clearly referring to this rajas in the aksha, rajas in the aksha, in the eye. So we have this phrase here, like as if dust and layers of silt cake into mud and lodge in their eyes. Um, and this gets, um, again, uh, expanded in, in various ways particularly around the theme of what does it mean for living beings to be mired in this state of delusion. And here it uses some of the poetic techniques that be, became quite important by this period in, in Khmer literature, uh, namely this kind of assonance and alliteration that develops across these lines that go above and beyond uh, the existing rhyme scheme. So if we look just at how some of the uh, both there's this external rhyme scheme. The external rhyme in here means the rhymes that link different lines together. So we have pom here rhyming with rum. We have kaya rhyming with pragnya. Uh, we have le rhyming with kwa and rle and anda. And then we have ka rhyming with kra and satwa and mo, et cetera. So the rhymes, as you might have heard, are not always perfect rhymes from the modern definition of Cambodian poetry. Uh, but within this context, these were understood as, as rhyming in a particular way. So that's the external rhymes. In other words, ones that tie different lines together as well as tie different stanzas together into this long thread of continuous rhyme. Then there are also forms of internal rhyme. That could be uh, places that rhyme like rum jum uh, or ngut ngul, et cetera, or they could be uh, places that have this kind of uh, alliteration um, happening. So certainly uh, phrases like uh, rum, or even the way the moha and the mo here uh, come together as uh, expressing um, uh, uh, a kind of play on sounds that's very important in this, in this type of literature. So that's something we see here. It's not as developed as in the next translation we'll go get, but it's uh, something certainly that's coming across. And then we have going to the second um, poly stanza, we have this, uh, these key ideas being uh, reflected in the Khmer as well. That Parma is likened to a drum, whose booms and beats uh, echo and resound with round and lovely tones, etc. And then again, continuing with the, this, uh, the, the metaphor that was explained around the, the, the sutras, the paramatta here is the synonym for the apidhamma, um, etc., etc. And then the last stanza here that's added, there's a portion that I skipped because it's fragmentary in all the available manuscripts, um, is the one that brings it um, in a sense, back to this present context, um, a present context of, of listening to a sermon. So, should anyone be able to listen attentively without lapsing? This is the most meritorious and fortunate. May your minds be of clear faith. So it's not about the invitation of the monk per se, but it's about the context of listening to the sermon. And again, that's something that's being added in this process as there's this harmony across the text, the performance uh, and the melody. Mm -hmm. Trent, can you just yeah. remind us briefly of the, the manuscript, like the physical specimen, like where you found it and what it sure. is? Sure, yeah. So this is, uh, this one again is from uh, Kapong Cha, Kapong Cham province in Cambodia, which is in central Cambodia to the north east of Phnom uh, Penh, up the Mekong River a little bit. And uh, it's this particular manuscript is one on a format known as Krang in Khmer or Samut uh, Khoi or Samut Thai in Thai. Namely, it's this kind of uh, bark pulp paper um, from uh, various trees related to mulberry um, that are. Uh, 
processed into this pulp and then uh, made into very long strips, which are then folded in this accordion-like format that we, we see here. So uh, in the Cambodian context in this period, besides the, uh, the an English term for this is leporello, mm -hmm. um, or sometimes a concertina folding manuscript, um, the, uh, some were used in elite contexts, like in the palace, and they bear the quality of the paper, and they might be um, done in black and then written on with gold ink or with chalk or other kinds of things. Outside of this, this is from a uh, temple in the countryside. This is the most common format. And unlike for text transmitted on palm leaf manuscripts, which tend to be longer text, tend to be more formal text, tend to be texts either used for monastic uh, recitation or for sermons or for studies uh, done within the monastery, these kinds of uh, paper leporellos are often used to transmit very short texts, informal texts, and sometimes have multiple scribes that are working within them. So that's why, again, we see here multiple hands, people have different handwriting using different uh, writing implements, you know, people adding their own notes and sometimes graffiti to different portions of it. This is a text that's been used and passed around a lot. So you know, these are burn marks from incense and candles because it was used in a time prior to electric lighting. Um, these kinds of uh, manuscripts are often circulated at the village level. In other words, they're not just stored at the monastery, but they might be moving from house to house. They can be borrowed. They have colophons that indicate how they were in, uh, in motion. Mm -hmm. So why they're important for the study of Buddhist poetry is that in the Cambodian context, and we see some parallels to these kinds of manuscripts in Thailand as well, this is where these short Buddhist liturgical poems are recorded. They don't show up in the by and large in the larger, more formal manuscript collections on palm leaf, but they appear in these, in these places. So they're a window, a kind of a bridge between the, the written and the oral traditions as well. So that's the particular context for this poem. Um, again, probably 18th or 19th century when this, this example the, was uh, composed, but by an anonymous author. Um, moving on to this next example, um, this, uh, we have a brief interlude. Um, this is a, an image of uh, King Mangkut Rama IV. Um, he composed this text when he was a monastic. This is not a picture of him when he was a monastic because he was a monastic before photographic technology was available in Siam. Um, but this is him later in life when reigning as king, taking, um, must be taking the white robes on a precept day. Um, but this, this he presumably composed early, earlier in his life as a monastic and is an, an expansion. This is actually the last stanza of a, of a longer set of exp expansion in, into Pali of this chant for inviting a monastic to preach. This is just the very last stanza, but it conveys some of the key ideas and is composed in this distinctive uh, Pali voice that, that he developed through his long years of composing uh, new uh, Buddhist texts in Pali for the Tamayutaka Nikaya. So again, this brief portion reads, Sadhu ayo bhikkhu sangho karo tu dhammadi sanang ayancha parisa sabba akkikatva sunatu tang. This is in a much simpler meter. This is in the very common um, Pali version of the shloka meter, um, which has various names in Pali, Anutupla is one of the common names for it. Um, but that's very, was the most common meter that uh, King Mang would um, uh, um, compose Pali texts in, and so indeed the, the most common meter for Pali text composition in Southeast Asia in general. But again, we see the way this is being composed to build on the earlier text from the Buddha Vangsa, but to tie it into this specific ritual context. So let's see what happens by the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century. We have a, another named uh, poet uh, attached to a particular text. And this poet is Sotanta Pratya An. This is uh, one of the most important poets in Cambodia from the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, he uh, studied for a, a long time, both in Cambodia and in Thailand, uh, initially as a monk, later as a lay person, um, and was a mastery of a range of different poetic forms, translated many texts from Pali and Thai into, um, into Khmer, and also composed 
a whole body of original poetry and prose texts that really uh, set a standard for what was possible in Khmer pro poetry at that time. Um, so lots to explore about the, for instance, the prose writings of Sotamta Pritya An are explored uh, quite deeply in the PhD uh, dissertation, and also the fifth uh, chapter of uh, Anne Hansen's book, How to Behave. Um, but there are you know, other ways to explore what's going on within his work. Uh, his poetic writing, in my view, and we'll see this when we look at uh, his travel poetry in this genre known as Niria in Khmer, Nira in Thai. Um, he was quite, um, I think, influenced by the uh, and just a, an earlier generation, maybe actually maybe two generations earlier, uh, Thai poet uh, Sun Thon Pu, whose work we will also look at uh, in, in a later lecture this week. Um, and we see that in the, the way he was able to master these particular poetic forms and bring in these ideas around uh, assonance or euphony that, that, that tied the the, the sound of these poetic lines with their meaning together in a, in a really powerful way. So this is, um, this is a translation coming out of um, Until Nirvana's time. And this uh, shows the first initial section of the text. Um, and see, it's, but it's very similar to what's coming before in terms of the, the meaning. But this whole text of 26 stanzas is probably the, the longest of all of these in this, this genre. It's sort of the one that's so far that's um, expanded the ideas within that initial polyverse in the most numerous ways. So let's take a closer look at what's going on here. So uh, again, we are introduced to, to Brahma who makes his request. And then the substance of his request is quite long. Um, uh, it, in, he says how the, the, the situation that living beings are in, some creatures are laden with lust, unable to grasp the three marks, others are ready to comprehend, thanks to your power, O blessed one. Um, if they could hear you teach the truth, their wisdom would grow in strength and depth. Please, O meritorious Lord, and humbly invite you to preach. And then, in a sense, here, this is still the translation of that first verse. But then we get this expansion that isn't really in the Pali at all, but offers this other uh, depth to what's happening. So here you can see it um, with uh, what's happening in the transliteration and the, uh, the translation. So starting from this part, uh, which is save living beings and slay their sorrow. Save living beings and slay their sorrow, their sickness, their passion, their thirst for flesh, that their darkness might brighten into faith and deepen with wisdom to reach the truth. Worldly realms are fleeting wastes, samsara's wheel whirls without end. Ignorance is the fundamental cause that sets in motion a chain of effects. It leads living beings to suffer, to drown in cycles of birth and death. The five morrows and blind delusion wrap them tight till they're stuck fast. And here we get this sense in that last line of how he's using these techniques of internal rhyme on that line, wrap them tight till they're stuck fast. Um, in some cases, borrowing uh, you know, words that might be used in a Thai context, in this case, hum from, from Thai, that means to wrap, to cover. Uh, this is very rarely used in Khmer, but here it, it fits this context because rum is the same meaning in Khmer, rit meaning tightly here. And again, this uh, we have internal rhyme happening in terms of consonants, rit uh, rum, in terms of vowels, rum hum again with hum and jum, and then again back with consonants, jum, jua, no. And these, this kind of technique, with, which is we see all over the place, for instance, in earlier Thai glon poetry, particularly that of Sun Thon Pu, from the, who flourished in the, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, we see this uh, developed to its apogee in the work of uh, Sotanta Priti An. So, he again expands this idea of, you know, what does it mean to be saving living beings? And he brings in this other metaphor. We had the metaphor, uh, what will show up soon again around the drum. Here's this metaphor of the boat. The idea that the, the Buddhist teachings or the, the Buddha uh, or the Buddhist religion is in some cases a vessel that can ferry living beings to the far shore, the far shore of Nirvana. Um, and then this boat is described in particular ways. The image of this boat and the ways in which the boat is understood, again, back to a point you raised, Warame, that's connected to ideas in the esoteric meditation systems of Southeast Asia as well. Um, but there are also ways in which this boat imagery appears throughout um, 
uh, Theravada in, in Mahayana texts as well, as if on a water lantern vast the sky with fractal arrays of dazzling light to illuminate all living beings that they might know true peace and joy. Um, and even as he's trying to bring in and attune these meanings to what he's going on, he also has this superb control of the sound in that last stanza. Bringing the, the resonance of these different levels of external and uh, external, ex internal and external rhyme together. Um, then we have again that uh, expanded section on the metaphor of the drum. Uh, and what he adds here is this expansion around the idea of the four assemblies. Um, and this is where he writes the four assemblies of followers are like lotus buds in the water. Some will surface waiting for a sunrise, then bloom with the touch of dawn's rays. The Dharma is the sunshine that rises and gleams, casting its beams, lighting up the three worlds to make clear the path to bliss. And here, this sense of the four assemblies is something we don't see in the Pali, but it comes back to that term neya or neye um, as being uh, this uh, idea that comes out, I think, initially in Buddhaghosa's commentary to the Diga Nikaya, and, and its exegesis on the Mahapadana Sutta gives this simile of the four types of individuals. Mm -hmm. So those, uh, like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something that yeah, yeah. Um, becomes quite important in sort of later understandings of Buddhism. And does it show up yeah. in places you're familiar yes, with? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. 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 And so the terms that this particular passage uses here, so he explains uh, how, for instance, the first one, those that having risen out of the water lie waiting to be touched by the rays of the sun, blossom today, et cetera, and then describes each of these four flowers, uh, these, these four groups of followers using this flower metaphor, um, and then says, and so just as there are four types of flowers, there are four types of individuals. So those, those being the, no, those known as neya, and that's the one we're looking at, and uh, parama. So that has these different kinds of proclivities or mm -hmm. karmic predispositions that allow them to be more or less uh, receptive uh, to the Buddhist teachings. Um, so again, that's something that uh, unsenses is pregnant within the text, but then he expands and makes visible to the, the listener through, through this poem. And this is, of course, the version that's most commonly recited in Cambodia today. Usually it's actually just the last bit, uh, the portion that begins here with Sahampati Brum, and the, the melody that's used here is just like the one we heard earlier. So it's usually something like Sangham Patai Prom Aung Bang Pom Arakania Sam Dag Prayap Hekawi Dai Kita Yang Nung Aang Preputn Trung Anuko Prom Tatu Etc. Those being the first two stanzas there from Sahampati Brahma to befitting his compassionate state. Um, and that would then, that melody would then be continued through the remainder of the stanzas. But this section here is not referring to something that's in the Pali at all. Remember that the Pali that we looked at was just happening within uh, Sambhati Brahma's imitation to the Buddha, and then uh, this subsequent metaphor about the drum. Uh, this, however, is, of course, like we saw in that very first, the very the second Thai translation, it brings it into the present. Mm -hmm. It makes it clear what's happening richly, but it precedes that with this account of the, the Buddhist life. We have this very abbreviated biography of what happens after Brahma's imitation. In other words, the Buddha accepts it, walks to Saranat, preaches to the Banjavakya Bhikkhu, to this group of five uh, monastics, um, uh, preaches the Dhammataka Bhavatana Sutta and from that moment on continues to preach sermons on the Dharma throughout the 45, life, 45 years of his teaching career. Um, and then we get in the last two stanzas this way 
just like we saw in that second Thai translation, bringing it back to the, the moment of inviting a monastic uh, to preach. That is why right in this moment, we are filled with such great joy, venerable or virtuous one, here referring not to the Buddha, but to this monastic. We invite you to save us and preach. Uh, rescue those assemblies, um, again, borrowing the same word that um, had picked up our, uh, earlier within this term, Naya, still mired in delusion that their wisdom might bloom right here in this place. Mm -hmm. um, then something else happens in the story of this text. So Un, as you saw, was working quite assiduously to make his translation match those existing poly stanzas, but expanding on the meaning when he felt necessary and when it accorded with certain exegetical principles drawn from the, the commentaries that he had studied and translated over his career. In addition, however, in order to create this perfect parity between what exists in Pali and what exists in the vernacular, he then composed four additional stanzas in Pali <laughs> that captured what we were just looking at in Khmer. So this, which he added in Khmer, these eight stanzas, he created four stanzas yeah. in Pali to communicate that meaning. And it's a very distinctive and interesting form of Pali because it uses words that we would very rarely encounter in other kinds of contexts. But if you look at just at the translation for a moment, you'll see that it's it's basically the same thing. The Samadhi accepts the imitation um, by silently, the Buddha accepts it. Uh, and then this summary of his preaching career and then the last stanza bringing it um, to the present moment of inviting a monastic to preach. And in this, we find even the teeny details are meant to be quite closely matched between the Khmer and uh, the Pali. So for instance, when we have uh, in the, uh, the Pali, we have um, by means of silence, we have in the Khmer, uh, is the Khmer uh, pronunciation of uh, um, or uh, we have this, the way the term compassion shows up. Um, in Khmer, it's tam piawe kum karna. So tam, in accordance to the piawe, the bhava, the state, kum uh, karna, the virtues of karna, uh, of compassion, just like we have here in the, the Pali uh, with this very unusual gerund, um, ativa asya. Uh, I think this is, uh, never seen this appear in, in any other Pali text, this particular gerund, divasya, this having resorted to, it's an unusual form of the, this particular gerund, um, uh, to what sort of um, on, on the basis of his compassion, garunyena. Then we see, uh, again, uh, this parallels being uh, developed for in the Khmer, we have panjavaki uh, jia that is the panjavaki jia um, as the first, a uh, here being the Khmer pronunciation of adi. Uh, at the first. And then we have the same thing being expressed here in the Pali with Pancha Vagyadio. So again, very closely being represented, which was what we'd expect when he's back translating uh, from Khmer into Pali. Then we have this very, I think the most unusual term, um, well, I'll get to the most unusual term. Um, one here, this, this plan where it's Atasitikam. So preach sermons on the Dharma to fulfill the aims of living beings, Atasitikam. This is, again, a term not really used elsewhere, um, but it's a play on words for satartas, uh, that is sita plus artha, he whose um, aims are, are fulfilled, that's the sense of satartha or sadatta. Um, this play on words on the Buddha's own name is being brought into how he's describing the Buddha's career with this term, atasitaka. And then the, the most unusual part uh, is this, this phrase here, Magavasani. So uh, here I've translated as 45 rain seasons, but how, how does Magha mean 45? So the, um, this is a very rare application of this so-called Gattapayadi system of numerals. So it's in, in Sanskrit, there are different ways that one can uh, express numbers. So one is with the, the basic numbers like uh, uh, 
uh, et cetera. Um, bunch of going on, et cetera. Um, another is with using um, particular uh, nouns to stand in for numerals. So like one for the moon or three for, I forget which particular nouns are used in this case, but using items in nature or within the, the Hindu pantheon to be able to describe uh, and stand in for numbers. This is yet a third system. Um, that's usually described as the katapa yadi, that is the system that begins with katapa and yadi. Uh, and that's where particular syllables that are, if you write out the Sanskrit alphabet in a certain way, and then divide it such that you get nine columns, uh, those then syllables from any of, any of the syllables that fall into those nine columns, those can be used to uh, stand in for particular numbers. And this is something that, that shows up, for instance, in the uh, um, I'm forgetting the name at the moment. There's an important Pali treatise that, um, uh, sorry, Bajira uh, that Sara, that, um, that was uh, studied by Javier Schnacht for his PhD dissertation, composed probably in, in Lana in Northern Thailand in the 16th century, that details how to apply this Sanskritic numeral system to Pali. Um, and then we have here in the late 19th, early 20th century, and in one of the very few, I don't, I've never seen this in any other Pali text, uses it just in these two words so that he can fit 45 into two syllables. Um, ma standing in for four and ga standing in for five. Maybe the other way around, I have to double check. But um, again, this is you know, part of the, the genius of, of Sotanta Prichi and as a poet, but also the, the great lengths he went in order to make sure that he could have this sense of performative parody between uh, the two uh, versions and, and, and Khmer and Pali. So the last stage in this is uh, the ways in which this text gets translated uh, into uh, Vietnamese. And I can go into this now, or I can leave the last 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> Have a drink of because the nice thing about having a period of lectures over several days is that things can bleed into the next day and it's probably okay. Oh, um, is that? Oh, look at that, Ho Tong. Yes. Look at that. So, I mean, maybe I'll suggest just it, because there, you know, we, we do have several days. Maybe we should open up for questions Great. and then get to this as a, as a nice segue Wonderful. tomorrow. So um, the floor is open for those on Zoom. You can um, type in the chat. You can turn off your mic and just ask a question. It's, it's a little bit informal. Um, so please, the floor is open. So I just realized that you were saying performative parity, not parody. Yes, P A R I T Y. Yes. I was confused. Yes, no, I, I think in my dialogue, <laughs> oh. it was related to accent. It's kind Maybe. of, it would parody, 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 parody. For me, they're the same. Yeah, but they sound the same. But... Yeah, but in other dialects, they're probably different. Yeah. So just um, quick moment. So um, so as I understood that um, the um, the invitation for the monk to to give um to Dhamma. So at the Bali the Bali portion it's appear where the first um, when it is performed it is itself. When, no, no. I mean the words itself. The the oldest word. Where did he publish his, the Pali where did version? It, where of this? does it appear? Like, I mean, this version, where does. No, no, no. I mean, like Brahma, Jaloka, Tipati, Sampati, that so, first, that Pali. Just would, the very first one? Yeah, yeah. Buddha the very first one appears in the Buddha Vangsa. Until, um, so can you just go back? Like, yeah, of course. It, literally only that very first verse. Um, so let's, let's do it this way. So if we go to. Um, We go to the Buddha Vangsa, then this will make sense. Um, so, if we look at the text of the Buddha Vangsa itself, um, the very first verse is this one Brahma Jaloka Tipti Sampati. 
etc. We have a slight variation with anadivarang instead of anadivarang, but otherwise it's the same verse. But none of the rest of this is ever used or recited in Southeast Asia. So it's only this very first verse that's being excerpted. So can we assume that they knew it at one time? I mean, bit of Aung I was I was thinking it was uh, Sri Lankan, but it isn't clearly. Bit of Aung San is Sri Lankan originally. It's still going in Sri Lanka, right? Anyway, so it's it's a relatively later, as far as the relative chronology of different parts of the Kudakanigaya is understood. Hmm. Uh, we don't know the exact date of its composition. Um, it, you know, according to Theravada tradition, of course, it's part of the text recited at the first council. It's more likely that it was composed um, by the first century BCE to first or second century CE, I think, but it could have been a little later than that. Why did I think it was Sri Lanka? It's not, it's a Mahabhamsa. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah. Sorry, brain fade. Yeah. Yes, so this is, yes, yes, yes. So this is not a historical chronicle. This is a chronicle of the Buddhas um, that is within the Kudakanikai. It's not a separate uh, history text like the, like the Mahavaksa, for instance. Rick, may I ask the question about his back translation into Pali? Where yeah. does he publish that? What, why? Yes. What's the, what do you think that kind of, he's trying to demonstrate that? So it's published posthumously yeah. in the Kabucha Surya, this very important Cambodian academic journal in 1926. Mm -hmm. um, but he had already passed away, I think by, 1920 or 1921. So, um, and so he presumably wrote it down and he was presumably working from either European style notebooks that were becoming available at that time or in these kinds of leporellos. Mm -hmm. um, but like many of the poems he composed, they were already circulating orally during his lifetime wow. and people were using them um, you know, within uh, his own life. And so it's hard to, we don't know exactly when he wrote it, the, mm -hmm. the, the version that's published doesn't indicate any of that mm -hmm. because it got published after he died. Mm -hmm. But the, but the assumption is to demonstrate his erudition, was it ever used anywhere? Was it, was it deliberately some kind of attempt to, um, if you like, canonize the, his version or what, what's the, what are your intuitions about that? I think he really wanted to have it work in the case of ritual performance. Right. Um, and so in order to make that happen, it required, from his point of view, having there be a poly version that corresponded to the poem he was putting into Khmer. And he thought that that was something that was missing. If he was familiar, we know he was familiar with many Thai texts as well. Yeah. If he was familiar at all with that earlier Thai tradition, he would have seen that, that those portions were being added, but that there wasn't a, except for that one last verse uh, by Mang Kut, there wasn't an attempt in the poly to bring this into the present of uh, inviting a monastic to preach. So that may have been part of his motivation. I don't, it's possible that he was, you know, trying to demonstrate his erudition, but I think everybody knew that he was quite erudition. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's my sense. He was quite aware as a poet of how his poems would be performed. So he has a short life of the Buddha that was designed to be used in a theatrical setting. Mm -hmm. It includes the different melodies or different um, directions for how it is to be cited in that setting. So I think, again, he was aware that this is something that would have happened. The melody that's used probably predates him. Again, we don't have sound recordings, mm -hmm. but many of these melodies presumably go further back. They've been changing over time, but there would have been an existing performance practice. Mm -hmm. And by harmonizing the Pali and the Khmer in this way, he could fit his composition so, into this performance. Practice. How were the melodies notated in these? It, that was entirely oral. Oral, right, yeah. okay. Yeah. So um, in terms of the history of, of the, this performance, so yeah. do you know when, when did, like possibly, first applied? No, this is where you have no idea. So we have no idea when that first Buddha Vangsa verse was first used and to invite a monastic preach, whether that first occurred in Thailand, Laos, or Cambodia, or when that would have occurred. Um, because there's no, to my knowledge, any record of that in any kind of inscription or, or um, historical chronicle, etc. And it's these very details about the nitty gritty of Buddhist life and the way in which short 
poems like this, mm -hmm. this is the very kind of thing that doesn't appear in these official records. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we'll see in a, maybe tomorrow, we'll look at some inscriptions that do provide records of how um, poems were used and how liturgical poems fit into particular periods of time. We have some evidence for that in Cambodia, um, but often it's very hard to trace these kinds of texts. Mm -hmm. So what I can offer in this lecture is only this sense of through this process of translation and circulation, we can imagine a certain history for these poems. And we can see how they play out and expand over this time and space. But except for the ones for which we have a known author, these very later ones, and I'll also bring up tomorrow this version by Ho Tong in, in Vietnamese where we have a very clear date, et cetera. Uh, otherwise it's very hard to trace. Is one thing you're trying to kind of apply with, with this example, the sort of um, very intentional intertextuality of the of, this, of these traditions, or are you, yeah, yes, I think that's there's on the one hand there's it, it's there's this intentional borrowing and connection because people are aware of existing performance practices, mm -hmm. so they're trying to harmonize their new translations into this existing practice. Mm -hmm. um, and at the other, at the same time, there may be an urge to hide the process of translation. Mm -hmm. So Un doesn't talk about the previous Thai versions of these same kinds of poems, mm -hmm. but he chooses the same poetic meter and is making many of the same choices and presumably was aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But in the text itself, he hides that. We see the same in the Vietnamese, though it's a almost uh, very perfect literal translation of what's happening in the Khmer. There's nothing in the that version or the, the books that were published in the middle of the 20th century that really highlight that these were translations from mm. Khmer into Vietnamese. Rather, it's tried to be shown that this is a translation from Pali, because that's the source yeah. of authority that's being invoked. It, so there is this t interesting tension between alankara, between mm. adornment for its own sake, for the sake of poetic beauty and virtuosity. Yep. And as, as you say, like, demonstrating fidelity to kind of some authority, you know, and, and, and cleaving closely to that authority. That, that tension, I mean, basically in everything you've shown seems to be very present. Do, do you have a sense that, does it, does the, does the meter lean toward one side or the other, would you say? Or is that meter, is that, is it always that's a tension that's always there? It absolutely thinks lean to one side or the other. So when we're looking at the inscriptions at the very beginning, yeah from what pull, those are very much on the side, particularly that first one yeah. with that elaborate visual presentation, that's on the side of Alankara. Yeah. That's trying to, in a sense, not just reproduce, but also expand this idea of Alankara Shastra in a Thai context. That's yeah. the, the broader framework. Whereas what we're looking at here, I think is the, the aesthetic elements of it are subordinated to the ritual. I see. Uh, performance. I see. I see. So that's even the key another, part yeah. is what's happening at the ritual level and yeah. drawing the audience in. Yeah. Then we have sort of beneath that this aesthetic elements that support yeah. that, and then that's uh, in turn on this doctrinal basis I see. I see. Uh, for the text. It's interesting. I mean, so you could imagine, say, a, a certain set of parameters within which you could map whatever we're calling Buddhist, Buddhist poetry, you know, the, the sort of fit for ritual, you know, so alankara, doctrinal fidelity, um, felicity in the, in the sense of musical felicity or what, you know, like that there's these, we're working within a kind of a set of, you know, one, so what, what connects Buddhist poetry? A shared set of parameters possibly. Mm. I, don't, I don't know, I mean, I'm just sort of, but it just seems quite striking that, that, that there's these different, um, it's 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 as, it's not as though the projects are competing against each other, but that they are sort of aware of each other, and you give here to take there kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think we see that most prominently within this liturgical sphere, where it's very easy to borrow across traditions. Yeah. When we look at some of the poems that are more uh, created in an aesthetic context, yes. there we might see more distinctions between traditions and less yeah. possibilities for borrowing. I know we're getting to the end of time or we're already past the end of time. So if, if there's anyone in the audience who has questions or please let me know. Um, you can also write to me. You can also ask questions if, you're in, if, if this wasn't so terrible and you'd like to return another day this week, you're more than welcome to. Um, and 
Yeah, I, again, I don't want to take more of your time, but thank you so much for, for being here, all of you that are here, both those of whom I know and those I haven't met yet. It's, it's a real um, privilege and pleasure to have this chance to um, mostly talk at you, but we can have more <laughs> talking with you too. Great. So we'll see everybody tomorrow this time again. If there are people in the audience and you could think of a question and you'd like to pose it, um, and you can you feel, feel free to email me or Trent uh, ahead of time tomorrow. Otherwise, we'll see you. And I'll give you even more introduction to, to Trent's background um, uh, tomorrow uh, when, when hopefully we'll have more time because we uh, need less time to kind of get our operations underway. So thank you for coming and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you. Cool. Can we just leave here?